Hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to today's session. This is the first presentation for the Moodle MOOC. My name is Nellie Deutsch and I'm really excited because, uh, well, for a lot of reasons. For one, it's the World's Teacher's Day around the globe and I think that's really exciting. And the second reason is because of our speaker and what she's going to be talking about. So uh, if you could just add in the chat box where you're from or anything else you'd like to add, please feel free to use the chat box uh, to communicate, to chat. That's what it's about. You can chat. Nobody will be bothered by it. Um, it's not like you're in a face-to-face -face classroom where, uh, you know, everybody has to be quiet. You don't have to be quiet. We don't hear you anyway. So feel free to uh, use the chat as we go. All right. So uh, that's a great way to uh, stay engaged. If you'd like to know more about uh, the World's Teacher's Day, which is on October 5th, it started in 1994. And it's uh, available and you should promote it because it's about us and about teachers. Uh, if you're not a teacher, and uh, you feel that you'd like to uh, spread the word. All right, so let's uh, get started about the uh, presenter. Let me just get the uh, our presenter. Cheryl uh, is uh, well known around the globe. She travels quite a bit and uh, she's been uh, in education uh, for 25 years and maybe even more. You can see some of the countries she's been to. And I'm sure there are more, U.S., Canada, Australia, Brazil, United Kingdom, Israel, Norway, and China, to name uh, just a few. And um, she's uh, sought after, well sought after. And it's really a privilege to have her with us today. Um, the session is called Leveraging Tribe as a Means of Self-Actualization. And someone mentioned that this is really a mouthful, and it probably is. Uh, Cheryl believes that building capacity for change comes along by helping schools and educators across the globe make the shift into communities of connected learners. And that's what you're going to hear about. Feel free to uh, use the chat box for questions as we go. Um, today's uh, educators are not called upon to merely tolerate change. And that's what we've probably heard a lot. Uh, we are now asked to rise to it, shape it, and prepare the next generation to live immersed in constant in a constancy of change. It is about change, but how do we meet these expectations as teachers in the classrooms and in offices if we work uh, outside the education system? The reality is that it takes a village to raise a grown-up to. In other words, it's not only about individuals, but we need each other. And that's what it's all about. It's about collaborating and exploring the art of collective intelligence building and selfless tribe leadership as a means to transpersonal and professional growth. And many of you have asked, what is transpersonal professional development. And you're going to learn about it. So hopefully by the end of not only this session, but by the end of the MoodleMook, you'll have an idea of uh, what it's about. I'd like to uh, say a few words about the MOOC. As you can see, this is the second MOOC. We had the first MOOC in June, and there'll be uh, three MOOCs a year in June. October and in February. So are you invited to join as presenters and participants and uh, tell your friends about it. So uh, let's start with Cheryl's presentation and get started. So I'm going to give the mic to you Cheryl so you can add if I left anything out as I'm sure you will. Those of you who'd like to speak, who'd like the microphone at the end of the session, uh, please check the settings to make sure that your mic is working and nothing has moved, as they say on the plane, nothing has shifted in your settings and that uh, it's all set up properly. All right, so I'm going to, I'm looking for Cheryl's name here. Let me just pop this out so I can get a better view here. 
here. There are some people from around the world and, and some good friends too. I see that my co-author Lonnie Ritter Hall is here. And so um, welcome Lonnie, um, such a wise woman. And I'm thrilled that um, she some time from her Saturday morning to join us as well as all of you uh, from around the world and uh, no matter what time of day it is wherever you are so um, I did want to say that um, as I got started with this this morning um, Nellie was so wonderful to be able to say to me now I'm gonna be logged in as you so don't let it confuse you that there will be two Cheryl Nussbaum Beach so what your challenge today is in in the first step towards transpersonal development is that you have to figure out the real Cheryl Nussbaum Beach and uh, try to figure out which one of us in the chat are um, uh, Cheryl Nussbaum Beach so um, what I want to talk to you today a little bit is about this idea of leveraging tribe as a means to self-actualization. And I know um, most of us have thought about this idea of self-improvement or self-development, especially um, those that are in education. I'd be real curious in the chat, if you don't mind, tell me what it is that you do. What is your role? And um, what, what is your place in the world? Are most of us educators? Or are there people that um, do different types of things in here? So I'll give you a moment, if you would, inside the chat to let me know a little bit about what it is that you do. But I know for most of us that are educators, we typically think about self-actualization in the frame of Maslow's hierarchy of needs in ways that we can apply it to kids. We're constantly thinking about how are we going to help children um, become self-actualized? How are we going to help children move up Maslow's? How are we going to make the, meet the basic needs so they can get on to self-government and other-mindedness and the things that we want children to have in um, very democratic classroom situations? And um, good, I'm seeing that a lot of you are, are educators, so that's good. And what, what I wanted to do was take a little bit of a different um, placement of Maslow's work and to really start to think about self-actualization from the perspective that if we are the best that we can be, if we are, um, if we are, are moved up Maslow's hierarchy of needs to self, to the level of self-actualization and beyond, then um, we are going to be that much better, that much more prepared, that much um, more effective as a role model for not only changing the world, not only for helping children become activists in their own right, but also in being able to be the very best at what we do in helping children find their way um, in what they're going to be doing in, in their life's calling. So let's get started, and we'll talk a little bit about um, what I've prepared here. I did prepare a slide, and I want you to know that you are welcome to contact me. This gives you a little bit of information about me and how you can find me. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do is I've put together some resources for you that will give you access to the slides, and I'll share those with you in just a moment. Lonnie Ritter Hall and I uh, co-authored this book, The Connect Educator, and I um, just wanted to encourage you to consider um, taking a peek at it, to take a look at it. The book um, really outlines how you can um, build online communities of practice, how you can leverage a tribe, how you yourself can become connected maybe in ways you hadn't thought of, and how you can do things that are a little bit more than just sharing links or having social kinds of conversations with the very provocative tools that we've all been given, these, these knowledge management tools. So it's a great book, and I hope you'll take a look at it. Um, I also, a little bit about me, I also have an opportunity to lead um, a lot of educators from around the world in year-long job-embedded professional development, online learning courses that are structured around a community frame, and um, I get to, to experience speaking and learning and co-constructing with uh, global educators every day, and that work is done through powerful learning practice, so I hope you'll 
visit our website and um, take a look at some of the work we do over there. Love to hear your ideas and your thoughts about some of the things we're doing and see if any of that interests you as well. So some of the things that I'm involved in. The other is Connected Educator Month. And I'm wondering how many of you have um, heard about Connected Educator Month? And maybe you've uh, visited some of the things or maybe you even found out about this session because of Connected Educator Month. I'd love to know if any of you have, uh, have know about that. So in the chat, maybe you can let me know that or if there's a way, I've never used the platform, so I'm not sure if there's a way maybe with an emoticon to kind of give me a thumbs up or a smiley face or something to let me know. But Connected Educator Month is being sponsored, hi Linda, being sponsored by the United States Department of Education. Um, it is not being controlled by them. Actually, in a very um, impressive move, they are providing the infrastructure, the platform, the uh, visibility, the communication to bring thousands of educators and organizations around from around the world together to share what they know around this topic of connected learning. So I hope you'll take a moment and look at some of the things that they're doing. I did want to share some links with you from some of the things that I think are really incredible that when you have time, you might want to check out. One of them is a tool called EdConnector. And EdConnector is a, a platform that was created as a matchmaking tool for educators to find each other. Because we're so spread out globally, because we're all, you know, learning together very closely and intimately, even though our geography is um, quite a, immense, uh, they put together this site and it gives a visual view. The pins uh, show you people that are most like you. The thing that I really like about Ed Connector is that um, if I, as I fill out my profile, I'm filling it out with what I know I'm really good at, what my areas of expertise are, and then I'm also filling it out with what I'm really interested in learning, and then I can find other people that can fill those gaps that I can help or they can help me. And so um, I would love for some of you to join there and we could follow up and find each other. The other exciting thing is that there are going to be book clubs as part of Connected Educator Month. And uh, Lonnie and my book, The Connected Educator, is going to be one of those book clubs. And those book clubs are taking place inside Ed Connector. So I've put some links inside there. There are badges that you're able to earn. In fact, you get to earn a badge for this session. And um, uh, Nellie has put that in there for us to be able to look at. And you can see some of the other badges, freeze. too, with the links Don't, that I put uh, in the chat. It's so currently frozen. there we go for that. Um, so I hope you'll check out I think um, your audio is Connected, well, educator, but it should Connected be Educators Month. As soon as you um, get it going. I can screen share real quick. Let's see if yeah. I can do that. Not yet. You'll, no, it's still uh, initializing. On Once it gets desktop. going, Let's you'll see. have a chance to go to the uh, websites that you want to show, the screens that you want to show. See if I'm able to do this. I'll keep my uh, audio open in my case guess, uh, is you need help. Okay, I'll tell you when it comes through. I'll tell you when it just did. It went through. Just go back to where you were, and uh, it should be fine. Yes, exactly. Yes, I'll be your voice. Yes. I mean, I'd be the audience voice. <laughs> yeah. Can you see it yet? Not anymore. Yes, now we do. Well, I'll just see if it comes through. And if it doesn't, it says my screen is being shared now. All right, so do you see, do you see, all right, that's great. All right, and so you now see where it says PLP Community Wiki, yes? Okay, good. So this is the site, the PLP Wiki, that I've created a resource page for you. And so what I'm hoping is that when you land on the Wiki page, that you can go to Keynotes and Workshops, and then up here to the Moodle MOOC. And if you click on that, you'll see that not only do you have access to the slides, 
So every one of the slides are here for you. But I've also put some additional information, like the sites that I just talked about from Connected Educator Month, um, some books that I think are really good around this topic, some articles that I've read, and actually a beginning kind of uh, look at how you can build online communities of practice to really start to leverage your tribe. Also, some common pitfalls and challenges that I've found um, as I've in my study and my thinking around these topics. So I hope you'll take a moment to um, go through some of the resources uh, after the session. And if you have any questions at all, my contact information, of course, is in here on the slides, the second slide. So I hope that you'll uh, get in touch with me and we can further the conversation and we can start to build each other's um, knowledge and, and really leverage the intelligence, the collective intelligence. I'd love to co-create with you. I'd love to think through um, some of your passions, some of your ideas. And so feel free to get in touch with me. Let's see if I can make it back and I will stop sharing my screen. And I trust that um, it's now back on the slides. So here's our mantra for today. Our mantra for today is basically we're stronger together than we are apart. That when we think about leveraging the tribe to self-actualize, it's this idea that collective intelligence, that working together over time and sharing what we know um, makes none of us as smart as all of us. So I really want, as you're listening today and as we're going through the things that we're going to be talking about, for you to really think about this as kind of the guiding, uh, chanting theme that you need to be saying, that none of us is as good or as smart or as capable as all of us, and that we deeply need each other um, as we go through this journey. So let's talk a little bit about the foundation or the premise that I have for why I feel that um, it's through leveraging tribe, online communities, that really can lead to the, the greatest path uh, to self-actualization. And I think one of the, the foundational statements is that humans basically have a natural propensity to tribe. You know, we, um, we gather together all the time, don't we? We um, have certain tribes that we shop with, certain tribes that we uh, maybe go to worship with, certain tribes that we live with. And um, we have this, we go to sports and uh, other passions, art festivals, things that we um, align based on our interest and our passions. And so we have this propensity that we, we go together and we, we become in tribes. Because basically we know that social learning is just simply part of our DNA. Human beings are, for the most part, social creatures. You know, we love to be together. We're highly adaptable, and we learn new behaviors quickly. So it's the modeling, often, being together, watching each other, um, picking up key phrases, um, and then connecting those patterns that helps to build the schema, the experience space that we have to which we add new information and pull from. So we are, we are very social um, in the way that we learn. We've been that way. You can trace it back to even um, ancient Greece uh, with Socrates and Plato and, and uh, the forums and looking at that. And we've always been the kind of uh, creatures that like to learn together. I think we also have some basic needs, and Maslow helped us to think about this, the, the need to belong, the need to feel a sense of community, the need to feel accepted and appreciated. And so by working together in tribes or collectives, um, it helps to meet that need, that need for um, to be appreciated and loved and, and belong. I also feel strongly that um, collective and collaborative inquiry is what really um, makes the difference between a tribe that just hangs out and uh, maybe has you know, a beer together and a tribe that, um, although deep conversation can happen in those moments too, but I think it makes the difference between people who gather socially versus people who are really trying to um, think about and, and deconstruct and construct ideas on a very high level of cognition. So. I'm going to take just a moment and look over in the chat, and um, I'll be quiet for a moment and see if anybody has a comment or a question or a pushback on kind of laying this as the foundation for where we're going to be going today. So any questions or comments or things that you want to add to this at this point? All right, well, we'll go forward. 
So we know if we're laying the foundation, and I'm going to shut a window here, I apologize, because um, there's I noticed there's a lawnmower outside. Um, when we lay the foundation for social learning, it goes back to Bandura and some of the things that he thought. You know, when he talked about the advantages of social learning, he really underscored the idea of learning by example or reinforcement of knowledge comes with human connection. I know as somebody who grew up um, in very tough, challenging circumstance that most of the learning that I did, because we didn't have any books in our home, um, it wasn't until much later uh, that I was able to even own a book, and that it was through modeling, it was through watching other people and listening to what they said that I was able to um, really construct my foundational schema. And so it's, uh, I really resonate, Bandura's ideas really resonate with me that learning truly is something that happens in a social context. And uh, pre-connected um, learning world, pre-internet, that happened mostly by the types of gatherings, families, you know, in our places of worship and things of that nature. Take it into the 21st century, and um, scholars like Kathy Davidson really talk about how connected learning has the potential to take us much deeper in our learning. In her article that she wrote, Collaborative Learning in the Digital Age, um, she talks about that there's this interconnected, interactive nature of social learning that holds the potential to amplify the rate at which critical content can be shared and questions can be answered. And you know, what I really love about what Kathy has to say is that because of the amplification, because of the ability to connect with uh, many different people, very diverse um, ideology, geography, thinking, we're able to actually begin to put together patterns and, um, and ideas that might not have connected before. You know, traditionally, the way that we, may, we found um, the connecting of ideas was through maybe reading, uh, reading books, reading articles, reading material, and we'd see um, patterns begin to emerge and themes of thought and themes of ideas and then that's how our cognitive growth would would start to build and we'd get this idea like oh look she said this here and he said that there but um, what Kathy's finding in the work and her doing in her experience is that contemporary social learning truly frees learning uh, frees the learner to really better process the content um, around what you're learning. So it allows you to be able to search it, it allows you to be able to organize it, it allows you to be able to synthesize in um, much more effective ways than having to uh, manually cross compare things. I remember when I was first working on um, the work for different research studies that I was doing um, in my dissertation work, and I would have to take sticky notes, and I would put ideas all up on the wall, and then I'd have to look for ways that these uh, these scholars' ideas connected. And now um, I don't have to do that at all. It's just so simple for me to be able to um, find the amplification of thought and ideas from my tribe, from my personal learning network. And I wanted to uh, give you an example of that from something that happened yesterday. So let me get this link and I'll put it in the chat for you. I'm glad you're beginning to see the tribe concept. The tribe, um, tribe is a special word for me because I am um, a, a one-fourth Native American and um, because of that, uh, tribe holds uh, a, probably a, almost a spiritual meaning uh, for me, but I also like it in the, in the reference in the way Seth Godin uses it, where he refers to tribe basically as the um, online community, the people that we connect with in different ways around things that we're passionate or interested in, the way that we co-construct knowledge. So um, I like that, Helena, collaborative kinds of learning, not so much cooperative, and maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, collaborative learning for me is really where this self-actualization piece comes from. Cooperative learning is really more focused on the task. If you and I had something that we needed to do, we might pull in two other people, we'd divvy up the responsibilities, and we'd be cooperative. We'd each have something that we had to do, but if something happened and you couldn't continue the work, I could pull another person in and we'd still get it done. But when you're talking about collaboration, co-collaboration, co-construction, collective intelligence building, that's something that happens from the unique talents or the unique giftings that an individual has that they bring to the work. And the focus is no longer on the work, but on the true mix of the individuals that are at the table. 
And we'll talk more about that in just a little um, bit. So what I'd like to do is share my screen one more yet. time. Go I'm going there. to okay, um, actually pull up that link that I just put in the window for you. And I want to talk about something that happened yesterday um, at a conference that I was um, leading. So let me see if I can get to where I want to go here. Sorry that I'm just finding my way and working through this system. So if someone can vocally let me know if you can see the Google Doc that I pulled up. Are you able to see that? All right, thank you. I did go there. I guess it's just a little bit delayed. But I can see a lot of you have joined me here, or I have some people that are still building. And, and I noticed this morning there were people that were still building. So what I did is I went to Ontario, and I had this unique privilege of working with a group of um, educational leaders in Ontario that were, um, and it's northern Ontario, that were coming together, and they're really trying to get their mind wrapped around how do you build a connected school. So it was top leaders in the different school boards that were represented in northern Ontario. And what I, what I convinced the conference um, organizers to do is I said, let me come in. I'll do your opening keynote in an additional way. Talk at them. You know, fire them up. And then what I'd like to do is I'd like to be the lead learner. I'd like to participate as a learner and go to all the different breakout sessions. And I want to gather data. So I did that. I went to their breakout sessions and I, I jotted down everything that I heard people saying and I looked for all the connected ideas. Then once I did that, I went back to my room and I spent the evening looking for patterns and the way that they all fit together. And um, when I came back together, we did a collective wondering and I shared the different um, patterns that I saw and the different aha moments that I had around their work. And then from there, I went and even talked about their, their uh, afternoon keynote and how his work fed into that. And it put me in a totally different place where I became a learner and a co-creator in terms of the collective intelligence that was being built instead of just somebody who came in and, and talked at them for 50 minutes. One of the things that we did was this collective wondering. And I had them in a uh, chat situation type in the things that they wondered. And when they did that, I then took, went to my tribe, and I went to my tribe on Google+, on Facebook, on Twitter, and I, sa I put out there and I said, these Northern Ontario leaders have asked these questions. So originally, when they came to this document, all that was here were the, were the, um, the bold, large things, like the I wonder statements. And I said, if you could help me um, flesh these out, they would love, I'd love for you to help us build some collective intelligence around your wisdom. And so um, if you, I'll scroll down on the page, but you can see people from all over the world started coming in and adding their ideas. Would love for you to add yours to this document as well. But they came in and started answering their questions. And so you can see Tom from um, Ottawa, and then you can see Anne from Norway, and different people that have come in. There's somebody from Philadelphia, and both educational leaders, um, uh, educate, also practitioners of different types, higher ed. Uh, people are represented, but pretty quickly, all the questions were being answered, not by some knowledge holder, giver, uh, leader, person at the top, but collectively, by all of us, by the tribe, we were able to um, come together and really think about these ideas as a, as a group. And so I think in very short order, what happened is that we were able to um, gather, because of the amplification, lots of information that allowed us to really think critically about the questions that they were asking. It made it relevant because they nope, were their questions, not what it. I decided. Nope. It made it um, global because you had the diversity of ideas, so the potential for innovation was there in a much greater way. And so by connecting to the tribe, as Kathy Davidson's pointing out here, it truly gave us the opportunity to think very deeply. So I'm going to stop and see if you have any questions or comments uh, at this at this point of the game. Nellie, are you seeing anything in the chat of which I should be aware? Any questions or comments or themes emerging there? All right, I have another link for you. If you're interested in the format of that conference and you'd like to see the summary of how I pulled everything together on day two, um, I've put a link there and feel free to look at that.
um, when you feel comfortable. So I guess the idea that I'm trying to make here is that connected learning sometimes even trumps face-to-face -face learning when it comes to deep uh, thinking. You know, most people would say, no, 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 it's, uh, do online learning if you can, because, you know, globally, we all can't be in the same place. But if you, the highest level of learning is going to happen when we're all in the same room. And actually, what um, Fran, Franz Johansson found out in the Medici effect is that virtually, when you had people adding to collective intelligence the way we have the potential to do here today in the chat, that when you were brainstorming, that we, that nearly twice the ideas were generated than when we were um, than if we were all sitting face to face in the same room and the reason was is that because um, when we're in the same room there's so much side conversation and so much deconstruction and so much uh, critical ideas around a particular idea that you don't get nearly the amount of um, data generated uh, to be able to synthesize and think about so sometimes when you're thinking about um, deep learning uh, online and connected learning really will trump face-to-face -face learning. Now, I don't know how many of you have read The Medici Effect by Johansson, and I'd love it if somebody would go get the link. I don't have that one. I didn't Google that for you um, for this book. It's a great book. And what it does is it he, in this book, he explores this idea that um, inter, in best innovation comes from the intersection of fields. It's that when you bring different disciplines and different cu cultures together, extraordinary ideas will emerge. And the reason for that is because our experience base is so different. So we all have these very um, diversified uh, sets of schema. And when we bring that together into one place, um, it's just an amazing thing. And so he found that if you want to truly be more innovative, be more creative, if you want to move yourself to become a deeper thinker towards self-actualization, then having a diverse tribe is better than just hanging with the people you normally hang with. That there's only there's a ceiling there when like-minded people who are together on a regular basis who have similar uh, shared vision and, and mindset uh, work together when you bring in a tribe of people from around the world. But the potential for uh, deep creative thought is, is a lot greater. So I've brought up this graphic um, of Maslow's work, and I, I like this. There's a couple versions that we're going to look at as we talk about self-actualization. But I really like this one because I think that um, one of the things that it points out that a lot of the graphics that you can find on the web don't is this idea of regression. And that a lot of times when you are moving up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and, and it's important also here to note that sometimes this isn't a hierarchy. I think what happens really is that, like, let's say you meet your um, your safety needs and your basic needs and you get those needs met. Well, then when you then you start seeing that you have this need for love and belonging and acceptance and that sort of thing. Well, I don't think you ever leave the bottom needs. And I think sometimes some will override others. I know when I'm in a very um, exciting challenging uh, transformational kind of learning experience I'm not hungry you know I'm not thinking about it. so I think that um, it's cyclic but I don't think you're able to move to the higher levels until you've once grasped them but once you grasp them then I think they become part of uh, your mode of operation uh, there can be a um, regression when you're under high stress or when a certain thing remains unfulfilled for a long time uh, you can tend to um, to go down a level because of uh, focusing on negative and you know not being able to be realized and move along in your own personal development. And so I think that's an important uh, point to make that um, this description of Maslow's hierarchy um, points out. So interestingly enough, and I'll, I'll show this on several occasions, the love and belonging level and the esteem level, that's where most of the activity that's happening out in the web and online uh, most tribe development or personal learning network development, online communities, is really working at this idea of I want to be part of a group, I want to have an identity with the cool kids online or with the people who love to talk about um, uh, project-based learning or, or whoever the people are online that I align myself with. And that so most of what happens, there's a lot of ego that's there where, hey, look at me, look at me. And, um, and then there's some self-esteem building. 
What I don't see, well, I do see self-efficacy opportunities. I'm blogging, I'm reflecting, I'm interacting with other people, we're sharing links, we're having conversations like here. There's not as many opportunities to become self-actualized and move past that to the point that we really are um, thinking very deeply and then acting upon what it is that we create and working with other people in collaborative ways so that we truly are starting to um, uh, move higher up this, this hierarchy. This, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I think this graphic does even a better job of really showing the journey to um, self-actualization, where you can really start to think about what comes after that, you know? So once I'm a self-actualized individual, then where do I go? You know, Maslow's really proposed this hierarchy of needs to um, kind of explain human behavior. But one of the things that's most interesting is that the lower levels are basic needs that have to be met and his suggestion was is that if those needs aren't met then you can't really get on to the other levels which aren't so much needs that need to be met as much as they are a journey that needs to be traveled um, he does take you up to the peak of this uh, transpersonal development and at the peak it's self-actualization or transcendence where I'm helping other people it's interesting I heard someone compare it once to um, curation Typically, when we think of curation online, I think that this is a very low level kind of thing, especially in co cognition, that it's just harvesting and gathering links and, you know, putting together PowerPoints and things like that. And this person, uh, and I can't remember who it is now, I believe it was George Siemens, um, but I'm not sure. And what, what, he, what the individual was talking about is he said that curation actually is a very high skill that probably only 2% of, of the people actually um, are able to move towards. And I think he, what he was describing in curation was the curating of people and ideas and helping people to find each other and, and connecting great a uh, self-actualized person with another great self-actualized person, so what they co-create will be even better, and it'll be good for the good of the whole, and it'll um, it'll make the world a better place to live in. It'll really leave a legacy. So this transcendence level is tied nicely to the idea of um, curation, and so I like that. I like that a lot. So Maslow um, was interested in what a man can be, he should be, and um, he talked about the peak experiences at the very top, which um, are what I'm considering transpersonal development, that as educators, as individuals, as little children, we need to be helping them understand how to be other-minded, how to be self-governed, and then in our own personal lives, we need to be focusing on our own growth. The example, the keynote. A lot of times a key, as a keynote, I will come into a conference, have enormous potential to learn with people very different than myself, and I'm there with them for maybe 50 minutes or maybe a couple hours, and I never really position myself as a learner first. Now, I talk a good game, but I don't walk it, because while I say that people need to be a learner first, I'm not positioning myself to be that learner so that I can start to self-actualize, and then I can move up in my own um, becoming. And it's through that becoming, it's through understanding what scientists are by doing science, by understanding what history is by being a historian, by understanding the art and craft of writing or speaking, by doing, taking on and becoming those, those individuals that do those things on a daily basis, that, um, that I'm really going to become self-actualized, that I really am going to become the best that I can be, which then I can then pour out to the people that I want to help also become. Because, you know, we can't give away what we don't own. And so it's important that um, you own some of these things in your own personal development to truly um, be able to give students the agency that they need and help them believe in their ability to self-actualize and help them find their way. In that. I do believe that um, self-actualization is something that brings about deep happiness. Um, when you get to the level of uh, self-actualization. There's certain uh, characteristics that you have. I think self-acceptance um, and that you are willing to accept people for who they are, that uh, 
you don't have to be very fundamental in your beliefs. You can, you're willing to entertain other ideas and thoughts very different than your own, not maybe accept them into your own value system, but at least honor the other people's rights to have that. I also think um, people that are self-actualized are more realistic that um, they have a sense of realism in that they don't uh, go to the extreme in terms of um, blowing things out of proportion and, and um, that they really think more logically and rationally about problems and around issues. I also think that they're problem-centered. Self-actualized people actually enjoy um, being given problems to solve. They have a strong sense of personal ethics and responsibility. And uh, so um, problem-solving, uh, they have a great amount of adaptive expertise so that they're able to adapt to different kinds of settings and be able to apply that adaptability to the problems that they're, um, that they're trying to solve. I also feel that self-actualized people will have these peak experiences, and it's very interesting. If you look at the research, um, when it talks about the peak experiences that self-actualized people have, where they'll have moments of euphoria, and they'll have moments where they feel deeply saddened by something, and maybe they'll even pull over on the side of the road and just weep at the state of humanity or something that they've seen, that when... Um, when, as they were, as I was reading the research and I was thinking about it, I thought this very much sounds like bipolar. And then, just as a kind of offshoot, because I can't help myself, you know, having the mind of a researcher, I immediately thought, I wonder if maybe bipolar, and please forgive me, I'm not a psychologist, so this is just a wondering, just a thought. I wonder if maybe bipolar is somebody who um, is having some of the attributes of someone who is self actualized without having gone the journey without having gone through the hierarchy of development of having other needs met. And so it go, kind of goes haywire. And I don't know that there's any foundation to that. I just thought it was interesting to think about. I also think self-actualized people have a great deal of autonomy. And so they um, don't have to follow the rules. They don't have to have a lot of structure. Uh, they feel comfortable in places where they can self-direct their own learning. They do enjoy solitude. Um, Self-actualized people, while they understand how to leverage the tribe to learn and to co-create and to become better, and they understand that they need other people to become better, they also enjoy the drawing away. You know, there's a point that, and I'm speaking to myself as I say this, there's a point where we have to stop doing, there's a point where we have to stop experiencing, and we really have to pull back and reflect on those experiences and to think very deeply to, in order for us to be able to grow in order for us to move towards uh, self-actualization. And I think self-actualized so people has, realize uh, that comment there. I don't know if well, there always it. is a means to an end. Uh, Leveraging question. your tribe is a means to an end. That it's not about that. It's about the journey. You know, it's I've like Tennyson said, I'm a part of all that I've met. So and I think that it's about like, uh, being with people and allowing them to uh, shape us and think about, live um, by others rules. you know, is and, and to true? think about what they have that will help us to become better people. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment and look at the chat. Nelly, is there anything that I need to uh, address or would anybody like to grab the mic and weigh in? Any of this resonating with you? So, William, I bet if it was known, you have a little bit of that in yourself, that there are times when you refuse to have yourself uh, to fit inside a box. And I think self-actualization isn't so much an end point as it is a journey. That's why I say that while Maslow created it in a hierarchy, I think that when you put people as a connected learner, and if you can imagine yourself in the connected learner in the middle, that there's all these uh, levels where sometimes it's about me and all about me and my ego, and, and then I'll realize and I'll step back and for a moment I'll be totally other-minded and I'll be moving towards self-actualized self behaviors. And then you know I might regress and come back. So I think that it's not as rare as we think. I think probably those who have achieved transcendence would probably be about 2% of the population. But I do think that self-actualization, at least fleeting moments of coming in and out of it, is much more common um, than we think. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? I like that. I like that, Helena. I like what you've said there. I think it also is very important. 
So I think there's certain motivations uh, to be on the web. I think the reason that connected learning and those of us that have discovered it and have drank the Kool-Aid, if you will, um, who are there and we're willing to participate and we get it and we want to be there, that a great deal of it happens because we're not only being, um, we're not only experiencing self-efficacy, we're not only um, growing in our own person, but we're experiencing something very different and that is collective efficacy. The opportunity to make a deep commitment to other people in a tribe and then move from there to this place that um, we begin to build culture around that. We begin to have, um, you know, things inside jokes and inside things that go on. And we begin to really feel connected and a part of each other, which creates this psychological well-being, this social connectedness. You know, Pam uh, Rutledge talks about this a lot. She really talks about this idea that social media allows for us to truly be able to meet our needs and that um, once you take Maslow and you put it into a connected space, it isn't so hierarchical. It isn't quite built around a hierarchy anymore. You know, I think that because the, the ability of these social tools to allow for amplification of my ideas that they can connect to very different people, just like we're doing right now, that those people then have the opportunity to give back, where traditionally you'd go to a conference, the keynote would give you his ideas, you'd read the book with the author, and it was very linear. Now it's not. There's a reciprocal arrangement that it provides the opportunity to not only leverage, but learn from your tribe in very deep and meaningful ways that move you up uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs to self-actualization. So what we're really talking about here is a human network. What we're really talking about is that it isn't a group of tools. It isn't, oh, did you check out this tool or that tool? While they're important simply because we have to learn to drive a car, we have to learn to cut with a fork and knife, we have to learn how to use a zipper. I mean, the, there, it's important to know tools from that perspective. The more important piece is that the tools serve as a portal through which I pass to connect with you to be able to learn from you, to be able to read what Helena and what William are saying, and for me to walk away changed because of that, and for me to be able to take that and add it to my schema and then begin to become even more evolved or more actualized in my own being and, be, and actually become a better person because of having interacted with them and uh, po possibly followed up and learned from them. Because the truth is, in this connected world in which we live, Having the ability with a, just a couple clicks to find people, to vet people, to learn from individuals who are very different than myself. I mean, look at the diversity we have in here just by geography. That because of that, we are all free range learners. We are all able to learn what we want to learn, we, um, when we want to we learn, it, lost, and how uh, we want to learn it. Sure. And that requires a different type of disposition, a different type of ethics in order to be able it to. Looks like, um, uh, uh, self-actualize in online but, uh, spaces, I stopped the recording, but it also so allows that, um, the potential for it to happen in a much more effective, much more work. efficient way. Are there any way uh, questions? Sure, we'll be back, I'm try. sure. If you're willing to not just... But while we're waiting, uh, how about a little bit of uh, music? Okay. Um, we've got the um, the Moodle song. Okay, which is, um, I think this is the opening. These are the words. So I'm just going to add that while we're waiting. Okay, uh, it shouldn't take long. So uh, here we go. I hope you enjoy it. Jason's in the house. You can... All right, everybody, let me see you put your hands together if when you learn, you're entertained, and when you're entertained, you learn. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> M double O to the D L E F to the O to the O to the C. We're in the mood, oh, mood, in Wiz IQ. As a crew, we pursue, renew, and review. Everywhere we 
you share and compare points of view in Wiz IQ. There's so much we can do. We're open source as a group. We pack force. The loop is all we are. Wherever we are, near and far, we align to learn. We yearn to connect. Our intellects intersect, reflect, then inject. Much love into our projects with mutual respect. There's no limit to our prospects. We yearn to connect. Our intellects intersect, reflect, then inject. Much love into our projects with mutual respect. There's no limit to our prospects. We're in the mood to move. In Wiz IQ, as a crew, we pursue, renew, and review. Everywhere we share and compare points of view. In Wiz IQ, there's so much we can do. We're in the mood to move. In Wiz IQ, as a crew, we pursue, renew, and review. Everywhere we share and compare points of view. In Wiz IQ, there's so much we can do. For a master class to have class and be a blast, it has to surpass this other class of flutes they call moops. Don't conceal the real deals, the seal. We gotta socially engage on the world stage. That's For the a end. massive class to have class and All be right, a Cheryl, blast, I hope to surpass this All right, other class of flutes uh, they call moops. Don't conceal the real deals, right the right seal. Now. We gotta uh, socially singing. engage on the world stage. All right, glad stage. you're back. Do it with me now. Yeah, come on, <laughs> come on. Come socially on. engage on the world stage. Socially engage on the world stage. I'm back. M to the O to the D L E. M to the O to the O to the C. All right, good. Jason, that was awesome. You rock. I love it. Sorry, I dropped off. I still have connectivity. I don't know why I was out of, of the Moodle because um, I was able to Skype in the background. But anyway, I'm back. So yay. So um, I am hoping that you will actively use the chat because I want to be selfish and I want to learn from you as we're going through. Clay Shirky talks about there's four steps uh, to mastering the connected world. He talks about sharing cooperating, collaborating, and collective action. And that it is also um, the first the first thing we usually do when we're in an online space is as we're building our tribe, we're sharing, we're link harvesting. We're coming together like this to get information. And then we might cooperate. We might you know, say, hey, um, you want to share those ideas on a lesson plan or you want to build this together and we'll both use it. Um, but then we move towards collaboration and that is what ends up in collective action. Collective action in that we become activists and we use these technologies not only to um, make the world a better place, but there is self-actualization that takes place while we're doing that. So you can see here that um, the best place to start is to build your tribe, to start to think about personal learning networks. Now, I want to say this. In the, the distinction in my mind and the research that I've done, and I've done a lot of thinking about this topic, Networks and communities are very different. Networks and communities. So you can build a personal learning network, and those people can be part of your tribe, but you can't leverage the tribe until out of those networks fall communities, as Nancy White says. That it's not until we make a deep, intimate commitment to each other to grow together over time. When I'm in a network, and I'm interacting with my tribe there, I might be crowdsourcing, quick ideas that we share and links that we harvest. But I'm not truly building deep collective intelligence that um, comes from being part of the participatory culture of which Henry Jenkins writes about from MIT. That only takes place in committed spaces where we are collaborating and we are acting collectively around the intelligence that we're building together. And that is where self-actualization comes through. You've got to be clickable. I've got to be able to find you. I've got to be able to find your best pedagogy online. You know, we talk about that it's a do-it-yourself professional development time. It's do-it-yourself. It's really not do-it-yourself. It's really go and learn, gain as much capacity as you can so that you can socially come back and exchange that knowledge with the tribe and learn from each other and with each other and build new things and solve problems going to make the world a better place. Typically, this is the kind of network we all had. A few people, a few documents, 
But now our network is expanded. It's layered. That when you build your tribe, if you want to be able to truly plug into that tribe for transpersonal development, then you need to make a commitment. Um, commitment and, and uh, a willingness to uh, thinkfully push back and forth. It's messy. It's, it's messy kind of learning. And it involves face-to-face, -face, like the professional learning communities. It involves building a personal learning network, but it doesn't stop there. It actually takes you into this idea of communities of practice. So I'll give you just a moment to look at the slide. These are those three layers that I was talking about, that three-pronged approach. And I'll be quiet and look at the chat while you read. I absolutely love what Guadalupe said there. Whether we are uh, con um, conscious or not, that we are, where, whether we are conscious or not, that we are part of a tribe that we belong to, to our family tribes, our country tribes, to our professional tribes. So this is just a gorgeous way to take advantage of belonging to this tribe, the Moodle Online Teachers Tribe. So I love it, love it. All right, a little more about bounded community. So one of the things that I've noticed is that when you take an online community and you bound it, you make it into a walled garden, you make it where people come in and they grow together over time, that it's not open where people are constantly joining and constantly leaving, that you tend to have a much deeper personal learning transformational experience than you do if it's an open, what I call social network. I think community space, community and network get used interchangeably all the time. And I think community spaces where your tribe hangs out that are open do not hold the same potential for the deep learning experiences because of what all of you were saying a few minutes ago, that idea of trust. That trust is the ingredient that's necessary to learn deeply from each other. And trust is often uh, established when people can fumble with grace, if you will, where they can make mistakes where they can have messy conversations without it being Google. That when um, all of our mistakes and failures are Googleable, when we're trying to learn, when we're trying to self-actualize, when we're trying to grow, it tends to damper. Um, it's the very reason that the research showed that virtual people can generate more ideas and uh, go a little bit deeper than people face-to-face, -face, because it's tough when you're in a face-to-face. -face. At least online, there's a perceived anonymity but when you're face to face, not so much. So you kind of let, you kind of temper your words. Where if you build a bounded community, then you're able to uh, think deeply, and the trust is built that are in there. All right. That's right. You build. You get the trust and the commitment, and that's something that uh, actually Lana Ritter, Lonnie Ritter Hall has done a lot of thinking about too. Hope she'll weigh in. So Cochran, Smith, and Lytle um, talk about three ways of knowing and constructing knowledge. They talk about knowledge for practice, knowledge in practice, and I'm going to flip and then I'll back, and knowledge of practice. And I think this are pretty interesting ideas when we look at them because knowledge for practice is the kind of knowledge building that's taking place right now. Usually when we're starting at ground zero or some ideas are new to us or we want to learn more about something in strictly a cognitive way, um, not necessarily something that's going to take us towards transpersonal development, but just building our capacity so that we'll have value to bring to the table, we'll have value add. That when we're doing that, we usually start out in a more passive way. So like some of you are quietly listening and you're, you're passively listening and you're building the schema around this idea of leveraging a tribe for self-actualization. Once you take those ideas and you start to apply them in some ways, that's where you're really um, constructing knowledge in practice. So knowledge doesn't happen somehow when somebody's teaching. That's just the beginning. Knowledge really takes off and starts to develop when we co-create, when we leverage each other, when we try ideas out and when we bounce them off each other and say, this didn't work. Why do you think it didn't work? What are your ideas? What's your experience? And so that's knowledge in practice. And there's actually knowledge... There's a great deal of learning that happens in the work. I mean, think about, think about your own professional learning. When you go to training, 
that's not a deep transformational learning experience. Training is very much about knowledge for practice. It's stuff you're getting, it's the building blocks, it's the elements, and then you're gonna go apply them. The deep learning happens within the experience itself, from the work, from the doing of the teaching, or from the organizing of the curriculum, or from the creating of new initiative or the new project. That's where the deep knowledge is developed when knowledge enters. But I think what's missing and this is where it comes into leveraging the tribe for your own personal self-actualization and for the collective uh, good of us all, is this knowledge of practice. And I think knowledge of practice is really when we go to the place of uh, systemic inquiry, where we really start to think about um, more than just the nuts and bolts, and we start thinking about the art and craft of whatever it is that we're doing, whether the knowledge we're constructing is around teaching and learning or if it's something else. So I think it's passive, active, and reflective knowledge building that's done in online communities of practice, built on Winger and Lobb's work. Thank you for that. Um, also um, uh, built in face-to-face -face interactions and learning communities that we have. And then in our own um, escapades online where we're following people that um, are thought leaders or have ideas that align with our passions, our interests, or our professional needs. And I think it's a combination of all those that really makes the big difference. So um, there are certain dispositions and values that I think you need to have in order to be someone who's going to be on that journey, moving towards, away from just go, and moving towards um, transpersonal development, moving towards transcendence. And uh, I'm going to give be quiet for just a minute. We're going to wind it up in just a moment. But I'd like for you to look at these dispositions and values. And in the chat, I would like for you to talk about which one of these resonates most with you and why. So I'll be quiet and let you in the chat talk about which one of these dispositions and values resonate most with you and why. So I hope you're typing one of the uh, dispositions. Great. So just type one of them and tell me which one resonates most with you and why. Well, if you've just come in, Teresa, we're finishing up some Jason, ideas, and we you, hope um, that you will uh, stay with us. Yeah, um, hi. Ellie gave me permission to go over just Everybody. a little bit, and for those of you that would like to stay with us to do that, I hope you will. I'm going to be tying it up probably in another five or ten minutes, but I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about these dispositions okay. and values. Jason, why to share and contribute? Um, do you have access to the mic? Can you grab it and talk a little bit about that, or maybe put it in the type it in the chat? <laughs> hey, Dr. Nelly. Hello, everybody. I've got my kids bouncing around. If that if that doesn't bother anybody. Uh, I like kids bouncing around. Show me which one. Yes. Okay. It, it's it's not easy. It's not easy to choose what exactly are you saying about myself or about what I what I feel is most important in others? I'm thinking can you hear me okay, Jason? Can you hear me? Yep. No. Okay, okay, good. So I'm thinking in terms yes. of this idea uh, this idea of leveraging tribe, we're gonna have to change our values. We're gonna have to change our dispositions if we're gonna get away from me, me, me. That most yes. of us are stuck at Maslow's. It's all about me. It's my ego. It's getting my sense of community built. It's my belonging. It's me. And if we're going to move towards self-actualization, right. and I'm going to leverage you for that, then I have to develop a new character set. I have to develop new values. And so I'm curious, which one of these do you think is most important and why? That's a tough one because uh, actually I studied Maslow in college. I got a bachelor's in psychology and I was, I was really into personality uh, theory. So Maslow was someone I studied very carefully. So I, this has been very interesting to me. I love this stuff. And uh, it's pretty hard to choose one. I mean, it's fun to choose one, but it would be hard for me to explain why I, I think uh, one is you know better or more apt for leveraging a tribe. I think... Um, 
there's, there's, there's some overlap here, which is nice. I mean, I think if to demonstrate mindfulness is, you know, incredibly important, but I think part of demonstrating my, my mindfulness is sharing and contributing, for example. So I guess sharing and contributing pop out to me um, because I feel that, you know, as we're all more and more uh, free range learning, learning in social spaces, uh, it's not as much about the need to teach one another as much as sharing, you know, curating and sharing content and contributing if, if you're, uh, if you've got the, the interest, motivation and mind to be creative and contribute, that's great too. And, and to me, I guess, um, not that everything will take care of itself after that, but, um, that that's, you know, basically the core of, of, uh, I feel where we are with learning and the future of learning. So. All right. That's why. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. And I love what others have put in the chat. So I hope that people will scroll through the chat as they think about what Jason's added to the conversation and look at what so many others are adding around these dispositions and values. So um, to leverage the tribe, what we need to understand is that there are connected communities, tribes forming everywhere, that you have the tools at your fingertips right now in order to be able to build your personal learning network and out of that, Deep committed communities, bounded communities can happen. And it's very easy, easier than it's ever been, that your faculty, <clears throat> excuse me, your students, your school community, whomever you work with and influence, they need and want your leadership. You know, a lot of us don't think of ourselves as leaders. Some of us do, some of us don't. But um, Roland Barth talks about that just like we believe all children can learn, if we believe that premise is true, and I think most of us in this room do, we also have to then follow that all of us can lead, that all of us can. That circumstance might conspire against you, or you might not have a leadership density in your schema at this point, but that truly we can. And so because we live in a connected era where we have the tools and we have the ability to be able to share and contribute the way Jason was saying, that we need to realize that people want us to lead, that people are waiting for us to lead, that we're all leaders and they just want us to uh, not manage, not fiercely protect the status quo, because that's what a manager does. They make sure that everything's working the way it's supposed to, they don't want messy, they standardize it, they systemize it, that leaders are willing to take risk and they're really willing to think about how can I em enable the tribe to become empowered and share with each other so that none of us is as good as all of us we can build that collective intelligence so that through the sharing, the connecting and the leveraging uh, and the co-creating of intelligence, we truly are moving towards self-actualization as a collective, as um, building collective um, efficacy. And I think it's important to realize that not only, we, we got everything we needed when we were kids, we were told, you know, um, inside, outside, upside down, we're not only leading from the outside where we're leading other people, but we also need to be leading ourselves from the inside and pushing ourselves towards that journey that's going to allow us to self-actualize, to allow us to become that which we really want to be so that we can be at, at that most happy and that we can be the best good um, to, the, to the world as a whole. So that we can truly have our epitaph say that we left education better than we found it but that sometimes we're going to be leading upside down because we're going to be out of our comfort zone. We're going to be in places that, um, that we've never been before where it's going to be messy. It's going to look like, um, it isn't a, a, an art form. It isn't a, a synchronized, so much, standardized sort of that thing. Was awesome. And I that just loved it. Very hard. Um, I love the conversations the tribe for self about, that spontaneity, uh, so motivating that comfort about leading from being the inside that and, understanding and the that of, uh, when you bring we very so different people together being with very diff different ideas and, uh, that so little um, from being we're not always going to end up in the same place. Which is awesome. So I want to thank you, know, you for the you opportunity to come and share with you today. For, you know, um, I hope that what, uh, this has spoke to you. So that, that we can be comfortable all the time. And I surely consider but we forget what it was like to go camping and the fun that we had. Um, you know, how many of us have gone camping? Do you remember your camping days? Give me a thumbs up if you remember that. Uh, when you were a camp or, you know, a campfire and, and having to struggle to get this and that. Um, you know, those were great days.
we gained so much from that. So I'd like to thank you um, for coming and for giving us so much. And, and I'm wondering if I may ask Cheryl, what did you get um, from this session today? I felt uh, here's here's the challenge. The discomfort that I have is because I spend so much time working with people in virtual environments that it was that it was very healthy for me to come into this tool, which I usually use Blackboard Collaborate. So to come into this tool and and realizing oh, I'm not really able to make this do what I want yet because I'm not sure what to do and I don't want it to be so messy that people lose the the concepts that I'm teaching because these these ideas that we're talking about are kind of um, heady. And so I don't want to get too much trying to go here, there, and everywhere. And so I found myself um, operating as the person who was sharing the knowledge, but who felt very much like a novice um, because of my ineptness with this tool and not being knowing, can people talk? How do I do that? Am I able to leverage that? The other thing that I got out of this is you know, whenever you work on something, whenever you're thinking about something, whenever you're preparing for something like I was today, um, you see it everywhere. Have you ever experienced that? And um, just as even as you were saying camping, I was talking to someone uh, when I was with the Northern Ontario Leaders who's with a publishing company, and she was saying that in her house, now think about this in terms of self-actualization, in her house she has one towel she used for wiping down counters, she has one towel that she used for drying hands, she has another set of bowls that are just for the dog food and she doesn't use them for any of the food. And her husband said to her, why do you do that? When you go camping, everything's dirty, everything touches everything. And it doesn't bother you there. And she says, but, you know, at, at the house. And so it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting that idea of uh, we really get down to an uncluttered existence where we can um, think more deeply about um, what's important and how we're going to make our mark and finding our voice. I think one of the, I will just say this, I think one of the things that I'm learning is that just like teachers don't really learn, have the most transformation experience in training, students don't have the most transformational learning experience in teaching. That it's in the development of projects and the co-creation of content and the uh, collaborative work around building and thinking and pushing and conversations that's where the deepest learning happens. And so if we know that, if we know that's where the deepest learning happens, then that's where we should be spending our time, not on, I think when I organize this and I put all the links together and I give you the resources and I come in and talk yep, and I'm the one who's be. active, um, you know, that I am setting myself up to, learn and and to be the that. chief learner. I'm but, setting you know, myself up to be in the best position to learn. And we need to have you know, our children their kids um, to, or those to the adult learners that are thus be the ones who are most engaged with the content, you know, it's not that the are most that deeply involved in grappling the with the ideas, and that we need to be there just to ask good questions and to get out of the way, and that's where the deepest learning have to teach for the exam. And that's where, so through that experience, we really get to be a teachers, learner, like I, I did in Ontario, and really transform uh, and move closer to self-actualization. Mm. I think that's right. Right. Well, well, maybe maybe we do have a responsibility in that though. So let's think about that for a minute. So self-actualized people 
aren't necessarily confined by the rules. They participate in structures that they have to in order to be to live in society, but or to keep our job or to get our paycheck. But they also are activists who push back. And so I think part of the totally self-actualization that, process and is I've being bold and rebel, brave and stepping um, out and leading and, and gathering your research and coming you know, and saying, this is the best for the kids, not you this, know what? and changing um, the system, Muhammad being right. willing to you know, when understand the policy, own it, so that you can kind of advocate that, uh, you know, for a change do in the system and, and choosing so on. not to just so be controlled by the system, but choosing instead to be powerful. Rather than how Muhammad and, and um who and being actively fear, involved you know, in changing their that jobs system. and so on. And that's the very kind do? of problem solving that helps you move towards self actualization. Yeah, I um I didn't get to go through the full presentation because I always pre prepare too much, but I think if people will look at the other slides, I actually took you through, and I'll just flip through real quickly, a number of steps, uh, eight steps that I think can really help you accomplish this. In terms of bucking against the system, the best way to do that is first uh, be a learner, okay? So what you do is you figure out what the problem is that you don't like. So uh, we don't think that the schedule is in the best interest of kids because 50 minute segments won't allow kids to learn deeply and I want them to do projects, but how am I going to do that? You know, um, or maybe be a learner first, like how have others of you in my tribe, I'm leveraging my tribe, how have others of you uh, been able to personalize learning, allow kids to chase their own interests, but still do high test scores or do high outcomes on what was being required of us by the system? All right, so you study what other people have done and you wonder about it. You ask questions, you um, build that knowledge. Then you kind of put your act together and you put all the research and you make an appointment with the uh, people that are the decision makers, the people who have the control to change some of those things. You attend the meetings, you speak out, you write, you blog, you reflect. Um, maybe not in a total radical way that's going to get you fired, but in a very um, principled uh, kind of way and then um, building your personal learning network so that you can pull from other people what they've how they the steps they've taken um, building that collective intelligence around problem solving so you don't just come to the people who have the power to change things and say wah but instead you come to them and you say this is the problem this is what the researchers are saying this is what other people around the world are doing about it here is a five-step plan on how I think that we can address it what do you think um, and that it's by acting collectively Cheryl, around these sorry. kinds of things, by leveraging Cheryl, like you uh, your tribe, that's that possible, you will be able to uh, make the change. And uh, most importantly, though, uh, don't ever give up. Just, uh, you know, we are the voices. Possible, we are advocating right now, for people who cannot but advocate for themselves, the, uh, whether you're working with adult learners uh, who have not found their voice or have no voice or whether you're working you, uh, with children that, who not, um, are not I'll empowered in those ways. So, um, so that, we are the voice because, for you know, people we do who need us to be think the voice, about these things. and that's why we um, need to step up and right now we're all need to hyped share and excited. And but, uh, let's work together. Let's like, solve those problems uh, together. Thinking about it and figuring out how to do it. I believe you provide coaching as well. Is, am I correct? If um, individuals are interested in getting you yeah, to come to their school and so on. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Thanks. Yeah, we do actually. That's okay. Yes, we absolutely do. Um, am I still with you? Can you still hear me? 
Oh, there I am. Okay, I had so too many windows. Um, we do come to people's schools. We do. We take teams of educators uh, within a particular region through a year-long job-embedded approach. So, like for instance, um, a group of uh, across the Scandinavian countries came together, and we. I go. I fly over, and uh, we work together face to face as well as online. Um, I also do consulting. Like I'm working with the Ministry of Alberta right now. Lonnie's involved in that work, and we are um, working with their Inspired Learning Initiative. We created an online community. We're bringing educators from all over the province in, and we're working to build capacity of the individuals locally. Um, I work one-on-one. -on -one. We do coaching with people one-to-one -to, -one to kind of help them think through uh, different issues. And there's e-courses. Our e-courses are around awesome. very That's specific great. kinds of all issues right, so like this. Thank you, everyone. And they, um, that was uh, and they're, great. Uh, uh, you can There's get graduate credit there, if you are still working on a degree or are working on a, a another, or maybe your terminal degree that um, will apply. Um, and so they're done in a community format, so you can the, get a taste uh, of, of using really that three-pronged approach use, while you're uh, learning. So yeah, I would love to continue Thank the conversation you. either uh, Thank you, everyone. If you could just add forums that a you've set final, up or oh, I see someone want um, more Halima, inspired help, I'd be glad to against the boss. Give them a call and let's talk about what that could look like. You will be. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Jobless? I'm jobless. Oh, oh, she means because of the, the badge will help her. I, th I believe uh, that's what she meant. <laughs> okay, that's great. And, and by the way, you should, as Cheryl mentioned, join the uh, Connected Educator. It's awesome. I'm really happy that it all came together uh, in the month of October. We've got lots. We've got 10 more live sessions about transpersonal she said that development she's not and this was a great be start redundant, so, I so like thank that. you thank you so much cheryl and i'm looking forward to uh staying connected <laughs> okay good bye everyone thank you thank you for joining this is going to be on youtube without anybody's name or uh anything else that we'll get back to them thank you <laughs>